How are you doing? Thank you for joining us again. This is Deer and Deer Hunting's Deer Talk. Now, I am Dan Schmidt. It is June. I don't know about you, but I've already been shooting my bow. I am really looking forward to September. That's when our bow hunting season starts. And that's what we're going to talk about today. I have one of my best industry friends coming on with us, and you probably know his name, Bob Robb. Bob is one of the best bow hunters in America. I am just honored to call him a friend. I've worked with him for so many years. But, you know, Bob is not the type of guy that takes accolades very well. And I think if you don't know his history, you should really, if you've read any articles on bow hunting in your life, in a magazine, even on a website, um, read a book. I mean, there's so many books. The book on bow hunting that was written by Bob Robb. He has been in this industry for so long. He started in 1979 as a full-time outdoor writer, and he has seen it all. He's lived in California. He's lived in Arizona. He lived in Alaska, and he has got some stories. But today, we are going to talk about bow hunting because he is a hardcore bow hunter, and the things that he has learned in his life, that wisdom will trickle down. And it's something that I'm going to be very happy to present with you today. And let's get to it. Let's bring Bob on Deer Talk Now. So just like that, that's the miracle of technology. Bob, what I will tell you is I just spent, before you got on here, about 10 minutes praising you because I knew you wouldn't be able to stand me listening to me talk about you. So welcome to Deer Talk Now. Thanks for joining us this morning. Glad to see you guys. How are you doing? We're doing well. And you are representing... I know you're half, you're not even halfway. You're all the way across the country and you're representing the green and gold. I am. Awesome. Always. Always. <laughs> Since <I'm>, high school. <laughs> a high school, I mean, a California boy, Packer fan. I love it. So, a high school quarterback who loved Bart Starr. Who loved Bart Starr. And, and I was going to save this, what most people don't know, but I do know, could go toe to toe with Bill Walton, and oh yeah, <laughs> and did you guys beat him? We beat him in high school. Beat him in high school. Bill Walton, NBA Hall of Famer, legend, pretty awesome. It was a big day, kind of a big deal, kind of a big glory deal. days, as they say. <laughs> so we talked about Bob. I praised you up and down, and I know that you are way too humble to accept this, but you are. And I don't mean any disrespect by this, but you are a modern day founding father for all bow hunters. Um, I mean, if you're a bow hunter and you, if you have read an article, if you've read a book, if you've learned how to tune your broadheads and your arrows or your bow, that guy right there is probably at least partly responsible for it. And for every other bow hunter in America, Bob, thank you. It just means I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've been doing it for uh, for a very long time. You well, I tell people, this isn't gray, it's snow camel. You started doing it when Sixto Lascano hit a grand slam on opening day in 1979. That's when you started being an, a full-time outdoor writer, I believe. Yeah, 78 or 79, that's correct. So before I get into it, I, I want to talk a lot about bow hunting. We've got a lot of things we want to talk about today mostly bow hunting related, but tell us about, I know the story, but you were from California. You were an outdoor writer and a bow hunter in the seventies. What was it like back then? Well, Southern California has always been Southern California. It's always been crazy. And the big game hunting was virtually non-existent back then. When I went to high school, I graduated in 1970, if you can believe it. So we were bird hunters mostly, quail hunters and dove hunters and so on, and fished a lot. And uh, I got my first compound bow in college in the very early 1970s, a Hollis Allen designed Bear Kodiak compound six wheel laser beam that I still have to this day. Oh, wow. And when I look at when I look at it, it's pretty funny. The archaic sight on it had two pins, and I believe I had them set at 15 and 25 yards, and the pin gap on that bow 
from those two between those two pins is about the same as my pin gap today between my 20 and 60 yard pins. So that tells you how slow they were. And I got to tell you right now, deer were not in peril. <laughs> <laughs> I killed nothing with that bow, but I tried like it. <laughs> I can tell. Um, That's crazy. Then, you know, That's crazy. Well, and then fa yeah, fast forwarding to uh, in the 1980s when I worked for Peterson Publishing Company on the Sunset Strip in Los Angeles, you had to drive two hours to get out of town. And most of our hunting was in the central coast of California, which was a five hour drive. So it was not unusual for a really good buddy of mine, the late Derwood Hollis. Uh, he and I would jump in a vehicle at midnight on Friday after work and drive five hours up I-5 in the central valley of California to hunt wild pigs and uh, the little coastal blacktails or whatever. And we would hunt for the weekend sometimes and then turn around and drive five hours back and rarely did we ever kill anything but we went pretty much every weekend that we could go and it's like do you want to go hunting or not so it's no wonder i didn't get married till i was 40 huh? <laughs> <You know? laughs> well you were learning like from scratch basically i mean i know there were other guys doing it there was you know pete shepley had come along with psc in the early 70s it was really starting to maximize compound bows but I mean that was almost like going in blind right I mean trying to not only shoot a bow but then go kill something with it well you just you you learn like you do in all hunting you learn by trial and error you don't read about it or watch a video you have to go out and screw it up a lot and you learn by every mistake you make and every time I to this day when I go I screw something up and learn something but back in those days I met some real interesting people Tom Jennings was in the valley Jim Easton, uh, I met Jim Doherty and uh, Duke Savora, who uh, Jimmy was the first guy to glue razor blades from a two blade Gillette razor onto a old bear razor head broadhead. And that's how replaceable blade broadheads basically got started. Uh, Nick Molesky did the first commercial thing with Wasp, but uh, those guys were pioneers, man. They they lived and breathed it. They shot their recurves and the early compounds, and they lived and breathed bow hunting. They were fabulous mentors. Was that, I know you had told me a story at camp once. Was that the time, about the era when, when you, there was like a lot of feral hogs in California? And, and Oh, yes. So the, the wild <laughs> hog hunting in California, uh, I actually wrote a book in, in the 80s called Hunting Wild Born in California, and that kind of got the thing kick-started, but the pig population was started by the Spaniards uh, doing the mission back in the 1500s. They brought domestic pigs and, and carried them along. And then uh, a, a hunter imported real Russian wild boar onto the Hearst property in Central California. And of course, they all escape and they interbreed and they go crazy. And the, the pig population now is gigantic in California. They, they figure it's almost 400,000 pigs oh in the state now. And I just went down and shot one here a couple, three weeks ago in Central California. It was fabulous. It's super fun. What was it like? I know what it's like now. I mean, hunting anything in California now is next to impossible. What was it like then? Did you Was there a lot of blowback? Did you get a, a lot of anti-hunting rhetoric uh, back in the 70s and the 80s? Well, well uh, again, I, I, Peterson's was located on the Sunset Strip in West Hollywood. So if you killed Bambi, you were you were the devil, you know. <laughs> um so he didn't really brag about that all that much. When I told people I worked for Peterson's, I didn't tell them I worked for Peterson's bow hunting or Peterson's hunting. I told them I worked for Guns and Ammo or usually Hot Rod or Motor Trend, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, but we we had a little group of guys that we we would run around Southern California. We bird hunted and we deer hunted. We drove our vehicles into Baja, California. You could hunt Mexico back then on your own without a guide. Um, we traveled the West. We did, we went wherever it took to, to hunt. There just wasn't much hunting in California and there isn't to this day. Uh, it, you hunt there, but the game population is not great. And I feel sorry for the people that still live there. Really. It's a so, bad place to be. So how did, my view. how did this, how did, um, I know how Peterson's bow hunting started because you started it, but, um, how did Peterson get involved in hunting? 
Well, Mr. Peterson, so when he started his, his publishing company, he started it from scratch. He and all his public public all his publications were based upon things that he liked. So his first was Motor Trend, and he loved cars. And he started selling a newsletter out of the back of his vehicle at the Ontario Motor Speedway. And his his second publication was Guns and Elk. And his third was Peterson's Hunting. He was a member of Safari Club and all that. And he turned that into an empire that when he sold it, he sold it for half a billion dollars. Wow. So, I mean, it's a, an amazing story. But he and was an amazing man. Tell, tell us a story about uh, how you started the bow hunting magazine. Well, but... Um, I was working for Peterson's Hunting at the time and in another magazine called Peterson's Fishing, which is, it lasted three or four years. And um, the company decided that they wanted to get into bow hunting, did the archery business. They, they weren't getting any archery advertising in the Peterson's Hunting. And there were a couple of bow hunting magazines out there at the time, Bow Hunter um, and Bow Hunting World. And so they wanted to get in on it and they decided to start a magazine. and. They uh, had a staffer named Dave Etzler, an old guy, um, that they made the first editor. And before the first issue was published, they came to me and said, we don't think Dave's working out. He knew nothing about our true bow hunting. I was the only guy in the office that actually did. And uh, they said, would you want to be the editor? And so I kind of got snowballed into it. Congratulations. Went, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations. Yeah, like, you hey, have another job. <laughs> yeah. We're going to triple your workload and give you no more money. So, you know. <laughs> so you can work eight days a week now and fix up. Okay. But it's okay. I got to go hunting and all that stuff. And I love it. It was great. So that's when I met you. You were doing that. And then you became a freelancer, which I think is fascinating because you, you did it all. I mean, you're living in Alaska, killing grizzly bears, traveling, I think, what, five continents, um, bow hunting the world, basically, for 20 years? Yeah, I... I I've been all over the world, fortunately, to hunt rifles and bows, mostly archery the last 30 years, I guess. Um, and while I was working for Peterson's, you know, I also had a freelance business going. I, I wrote books and did seminars and all the stuff we have to do to make a living in hunting. It's just, you know, there was no internet back then. There were no TV shows. There was none of that stuff. So we all spoke at sports shows and, and you know, did seminars and sold books and did what we, you, you had like three or four jobs so you could make enough money so you could spend it all hunting, basically what happened. Um, but I got tired of LA, uh, I'd been there 10 years and I couldn't stand it anymore. And I ran away from home and moved to Valdez, Alaska, where I lived for 10 years and then lived in another five in outside Anchorage and had my freelance business going and I was guiding and doing seminars and flying midnight flyers and doing all that glamour stuff, you know, <laughs> but, but again, yeah, you do whatever it takes so you can be in the woods. That, that's all I wanted to do really. That's oh, one of the stories you told me was, um, I can't remember who, was it Craig Boddington I think you were working with at the time, or side by side, and you guys kind of huddled back after the season and said, had a lot of fun, oh, yeah. but you don't have any money left, do you? Nope, nope. Well, yeah, so our, <laughs> you know, our gig at Peterson's was, was really pretty good. It was, the, the publisher basically said, I, I don't really care what you do. You can go hunt all you want, as long as your work's done, and it's good. Don't ask us for any money. Don't ask us for any expenses or any of that. So Craig would go do his thing and I would go do my thing, you know, starting in September. And about December, we'd show up in the office on a weekend. And it's like, hey, man, how was your season? Oh, mine was pretty good. <laughs> what do you do? I'm out of money. Me too. Let's go to work. <laughs> I'm back to work. <laughs> so it was pretty fun. <laughs> man, I can't imagine, especially the, the, what, what you've seen and and hunted um, some some of the not only the species we're going to get into that in a little bit but um, deer were definitely different then than they are now aren't they I mean they had not been yeah, bow hunted before and now you're going out there bow hunting them yeah the the archery only seasons were just starting back in the late seventies early eighties so uh, well I, I for example I remember I killed my first bull elk in nineteen seventy seven in Idaho on a horseback in hunt with a rifle during the bugle season in September. Well, Idaho finally figured out that they needed to quit letting you shoot elk during the bugle when the bull to cow ratio dropped to like four to 100. You know, we were killing them all. So archery, you know, bow hunting was, was picking up steam and, and groups like Pope and Young were advocating for archery only seasons and here they came. And so 
all of a sudden we realized as gun hunters that were also quasi bow hunters that if you wanted to get the good tags and hunt the good seasons, now you really had to bow hunt. So we started picking that up. The first thing, it started with elk, really. And then the early deer seasons came on in August. And then, you know, the rut seasons, no more rifle hunting during the rut and all the things that you see today. And that's how it kind of evolved. So a lot more people got into the archery thing because of the season differentials that occurred back in the late 70s or the 80s. Well, let's talk about that for a second. So flash forward to 2022, do we have it too good? As bow hunters with these, I mean, everybody has them. You have these long archery seasons, and we just take it for granted that, you know, that's archery season, September, October, into November in some cases. Um, Do bow hunters have it too easy today because of those formative years? Well, I think um, what you're seeing is a couple of things. And let me talk about the West again for just a second. What you're seeing is that there are so many people that want to bow hunt during the rut or elk or mule deer or whitetails or whatever, that tags are virtually all by draw now. There are a couple of places that you can hunt over the counter. For example, I, I killed a bull elk last September in Montana in a unit you have to draw, but it's 100% success on the draw. It's a very limited area that you can do that. Colorado, you can buy an over the counter tag, but the hunter pressure is huge. So what you're finding is that there's so many people that want to bow hunt now that the seasons have been differentiated. And again, you have these long seasons. And the reason they gave us long seasons back in the day was that the archery equipment was so archaic compared to today's that making a 40 yard shot on an animal was holy mackerel. Are you Robin Hood? <laughs> to today, you know, 50 yards and under for a really good archer not that big a deal and then you know we can talk about the crossbow thing later but now when you've got the modern crossbow where they're advertising 100 yard shots um it 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 brings it brings the question out now of are we getting too good and are we going to kill too many animals and are the seasons going to have to be cut back again to keep the herds in balance and all those kind of things so it's a whole whole can of worms that's being opened up by the efficiency of the archer equipment and the efficiency of the bow hunter. That is a can of worms that we probably need to save for another day as far as just that part of it. But from the the part of it as far as, okay, let's just, for example, let's say 1979 or 1980, you as a bow hunter versus today, just an average bow hunter, what is the, what would you say, I mean, obviously it's the equipment difference, but back then were guys shooting 40 yards? I mean, I thought it was probably more like 20 and under. Well, the, the, the whitetail population wasn't as big as it is today back then. So there are more deer to chase around for sure today. Uh, also today, you know, back in the seventies and eighties, again, there was no internet. There were no smartphones. There were no hunt stands or Onyx maps or those kind of apps. There weren't chat rooms. There weren't forums. There weren't all, uh, there weren't TV cable shows. Um, All this information that you can get now quickly as a deer hunter wasn't available back then. But what I had to do back then, and and I'll I'll use elk hunting as an example. I used to bow hunt Montana every year. Back then, the licenses weren't crazy expensive like they are now. And there weren't that much pressure, but you could bugle hunt in September. So to find little pockets of unhunted land, I couldn't go to the internet or I couldn't go to an app or a chat room. I went to state land offices and I went to the library and I looked up access points that I could find little access areas between private property lands into what they call schoolhouse land in Montana. And on a schoolhouse property, which is public land that was set aside to be sold later to fund schools and education, but there has to be a public easement through that land. So I found those easements that no one advertised because the private landowners didn't want you to know it. And so I accessed that land and I had fabulous fun. You can find all that stuff today in 10 minutes. Back then, it took me weeks to find it. So that's a big difference between hunting back then and today. Now we all have, we all have all kinds of information. There, it's hard to find a secret spot anymore. Really hard. Really, really hard. 
And what about just the proficiency of the archery equipment? Well, shoot, man. I mean, so my first, I was looking at some old photos, get ready for this, a black and white photo I have of a, a little California mule deer that I killed in the 70s with a old bear two-wheel compound bow with brass pin sights and Easton 2317 aluminum arrows and fingers with a flipper rest and a 125 grain satellite Titan brought in that was launching out there at about 220 feet a second, wow. 215. And to get that, that system to group your arrows tightly at any sort of distance was really tough. And it wasn't just the bows, it was the arrows, it was the broadheads, it was, it was the whole ball of wax, you know, on shooting fingers. So fast forward to today, modern equipment is so good. I mean, you know, you can pull out, you know, any of the major manufacturer bows, a high tech carbon arrow, small diameter carbon arrow with small fletching and a drop away rest and an expandable broadhead and a high tech release aid and a very precise bow sight with a laser range finder, which again, we did not have back in those days. We had no range finder. And you can dial that thing up and in to 40 or 50 yards in a few days, really, you know, it's just, it, the equipment is so good now. It's so good. And it's fabulous. I love it. <laughs> it. It is fabulous. So let's just touch on, um, crossbows. What are your, you know, I know you've done it all, but what are your thoughts on where we've come in the past 10 years with, with crossbows now being included in most archery seasons? Well, I, you know, I, as you know, I, I don't have anything against crossbows, and I think crossbows should and will always be allowed now during archery seasons. That that uh, issue has been set to rest. Most states now allow it, and more are doing it all the time. Uh, as a story, we have an upcoming story in deer and deer hunting, right, on called Our Crossbows Killing Deer Hunting, and people can read more about this. But um, the question that I have about the crossbow now is it's so efficient and they are accurate to 100 yards. There's no question about that, shooting it off a bench. And when you top it with a high-tech range-finding scope with variable power, then the question to me is, is this really, is this the spirit of bow hunting? The spirit, to me, bow hunting has always been about getting in their face and getting close. And with that, you can whack them way out there. Now the statistics show that most people who cross hunt shoot them at close range, just like they do with other bows. Um, but I wonder downstream where that's all. I just wonder. Yeah. And it's probably a, a similar, I, I think you and I were having this conversation, a similar parallel would be kind of what happened with muzzle loading. Well, that's what I believe is that, you know, when you, when the, Muzzle loader only seasons first came out. They were just like the archery only seasons when they first came out. Back then you were shooting um, a conical lead bullet with no sabot, with black powder, uh, with a open exposed percussion cap and the rifle accuracy and open sights. And rifle accuracy to 100 yards, only a few people could do that. It was a 75 yard weapon maybe. And then all of a sudden it evolved into sabot bullets and pellet powder and variable scopes and high-tech manufacturing and now it's not unusual for a modern muzzleloader to kill something at 250 300 yards not unusual so again is that really a primitive weapon when when the when that muzzleloader now has better ballistics than a 30 30 rifle? so is that really a primitive weapon and i think crossbows are going to have to they're going to have that discussion somewhere downstream do you think it's um Oh, I guess I don't know how to put this, you know, because states are pressed to manage, especially some of these states with burgeoning deer populations. Is that a conversation you think that, let me just put it this way. One of my views, I'm not saying it's absolute, but one of my views is being, you know what, let's get rid of what all these special seasons and just have deer season. Open September 1st, closes December 31st, have a nice day. Here's your tags. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, and I, I think that that's a discussion that needs to be had, and more and more people are saying the same thing. Um, you hear rifle hunters all the time saying, those bow hunters are out there for four months, they're screwing the woods up, and they get the best season, they get the rut. Uh, and we don't. If you, in some places you do, but often you don't. So 
the gun hunters who are the majority of deer hunters in the country by far, and they are killing the most deer by far. Um, they feel like they're a little bit left out on the good stuff. So again, I think it, it, it comes down to herd management and population dynamics, which is not a one size fits all equation by state and even in regions of a state. So deer, you know, by all, it, this whole thing is evolving. Hunting is evolving. And um, it begets other questions like public versus private land. And baiting and uh, all these other things, predator control that are coming into play now that we haven't seen come into play in a, in a long, long time. So I think hunting is going to really evolve, really evolve in the next 10 years, more so than it has in the past 20. Matt. All right, let's take a break and let's thank one of our sponsors. Today's episode of Deer Talk Now is brought to you by Truefire and the Edge line of archery releases. Designed with a smaller than dime-sized head, the Edge utilizes a linear bearing that delivers an extremely smooth trigger feel. Pull the trigger back to open the jaws and let up on the trigger to close the jaws. This release also features a lockdown set screw for your length of adjustment. Once you have the correct length, just simply tighten the set screw and the length will be locked in place. 100% American made. If you've seen me on Deer and Deer Hunting TV, this is the release that this is my go-to release. I love these releases. I've been shooting them for years. And what I really especially love about the Edge design is its buckle fold back design. This allows me to put my release on before I leave the truck or right when I leave the truck and keep it on until I come back. Super nice, even for climbing tree stands, does not get in the way. For more information on the Edge release, visit Veridine.com. Okay, let me get to a meat of this conversation, the meat. Um, I just scribbled this down this morning. A lot of people ask, you know, we're, in, we're into summer, just about. Three things that I sh- should know to get that'll help me get ready for bow season, and I pretty much cherry-picked it. If you guys read Deer and Deer Hunting, Bob writes 99% of the bow shop columns, so some of these topics are straight from there. But, Bob, three things that you can do to get ready for bow season. Number one, th- this, and this I'm not making this up. These are your words. If you're going to get a new bow, let your new bow choose you. What do you mean by that? Okay, so, again, as we just said, modern compound bows are fabulous pieces of equipment. There are many, many, many manufacturers out there who make a fabulous product today. They don't all shoot the same. They all don't feel the same to each person. So if you are shopping for a new compound bow, you should go to a pro shop or more than one pro shop that carries several different makes and models of bows and shoot as many as you can. Get a feel for it. Some are just going to feel good to you. Some aren't. Get information from your buddies and the internet and all that. But at the end of the day, what feels good to you? It doesn't matter if it's brand X, Y, or Z. It doesn't matter. You're going to get a good product if you do that. But shoot as many bows as you can. It's super important. Super important. A couple other and things. Let me just, Sorry, let me just expand on that one time. Make sure also that your draw length is right That's and that your draw weight is not too heavy for you. And when you go to that pro shop, they will measure. They will measure your draw length for you. They will let you try different draw weights so that you can get something that fits you exactly right. Not good enough. Good enough is not good enough. It has to be just right for you to be the best shooter you can be. That's a, what That's where I was going to go because you actually gave me that advice many years ago. I, you, you asked me, what's your draw length? I said, well, I, I, can't, I think I can't remember what exactly what it was. And you said, make sure you get it measured again. And I did, and it was off. And then once I shot... I'm like, man, that feels a lot better. And then the other thing too is I dialed that that poundage back, and it's something you just talked about right there. And that those two things right there made a huge difference. Well, and and I've always shot seventy pound bows, but I learned, you know, I'm older now, and I learned this last year um, that when I shoot from a chair or a blind, I have to turn the poundage up. I I turn it down to sixty six pounds now because I can draw that. In and still shoot nice and accurate out to as far as I need to. You know, it's it's not a He-Man thing. It's a efficiency thing. 
So man up, man. By manning up, you, by turning your poundage down, you're manning up, actually. So. Then I man up. I feel pretty good about that. Uh, second point, why should you shoot consider, I should say. There's nof- nothing absolute. Why should you consider shooting medium weight arrows? There's big emphasis on heavy arrows, skinny arrows, all this stuff. You, you've been a big proponent of medium weight arrows. Yeah, my whole philosophy in bow hunting is balance. Equipment is balanced bow hunting. A balance between poundage versus speed and all that stuff. Well, when it comes to arrows, there are three classes of arrows, right? There's light, medium, and heavy. For bow hunting, forget light arrows. You don't care about a light arrow. You don't care if it leads your bow a million miles an hour. Downrange, you're just not going to have that momentum to get penetration. Conversely, when you get a really, really heavy arrow, um, to me, you're going to lose a little trajectory. Uh, so when that deer comes in at a little bit further than you think it is, and you don't have time to hit it with your range finder, that can be a big factor. And so I, I balance out by going to a medium rate arrow. And for me, a medium rate arrow is something that weighs between 390 and 410 grains, including broadhead and fletching and all that stuff. And if I can launch that out there at 260 to 280, which all modern bows are going to do for you, you are going to blow through any whitetail that you shoot uh, in North America at a reasonable distance. And so to me, that's there's that balance between penetration and speed and also accuracy. That's why I like the medium weight setup. That's a good point. Now, did you listen to what he just said? He said 260 to 280. And all the marketing hype on just about everybody is well over 300. Well, it is, but it's 300 IBO or whatever, and, and that's a light arrow. That, that is very misleading. And this is something else I, I will tell people. When you go to that pro shop and look at a new bow, bring your arrows in that you're going to shoot and shoot them through their chronograph so you'll know exactly how fast they're going. And when you, if you shoot a multiple pin sight like I do, gap your pins so that you know what that gap is and learn to shoot between the pins. Because, you know, deer, how many deer come in and stop at exactly 30 yards? None. It's 34 or it's 26 or whatever. Learn where you have to hold your pins to make that shot. And again, that's why I like that medium weight arrow because it's a little flatter than that that heavier arrow and it gives me a little bit more margin of error for my old man hunts. Okay, and the third point, a point that you told me 25 years ago. Doesn't matter what type of broadhead you shoot, expandable, fixed, whatever. Just make sure that thing is scary sharp. You know, today, that's not the issue that it was back in the day when we when I first met you. We were still sharpening our own heads, right? Um, back then, Andy Simo from New Archery Products with the Thunderhead was the first guy to bring in blades for his broadheads that were actually made by a company that make surgical scalp blades. That's not an uncommon thing now. And so blades out of the package are super sharp, but a person should test those things to make sure they're super sharp. And you do that by stretching a rubber band and touching it or slicing a little piece of paper, but never ever hunt with a broadhead. And I've written about that a lot. And the reason for that in layman's terms is it is blood clotting. A, a, a smooth slice is much harder for blood to clot than a than a rough edged cut. So the slicker the slice, the harder it is for the bleeding to stop. And what about mechanicals? Do they? I, I know you've shot them, so I'm not even going to preface that anymore. Where where did mechanicals start, and where are they now? Well, back in back in the early days, uh, mechanicals were horrible. Um, they didn't fly. They didn't perform. Um, there were problems, just like all new archery innovations. When they first start, you know, there's there's bumps in the road, uh, and then uh, the the rocket arrowhead came out, and, and people got fired up about that because they flew well and they cut well, and blah 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 on. And then and now the slip cams are, are fabulous, uh, like the rages and the the severs are fabulous broadheads. I would shoot a mechanic. They had to drag me kicking and screaming for mechanical broadheads. I just was like, there's no way. I, why, why would I do that? I can shoot a Thunderhead as accurate as I can anything else if I tune it properly. Today, uh, I would shoot a high-quality mechanical anything in North America, including Goose I would not have a problem. 
problem doing that because you're going to get the penetration and that wide cut, which is critical, I think, to knocking something down quick. That's the biggest thing that I think is is that wide cut. Um, One thing I've I've always said is people blame the equipment a lot, especially broadheads, uh, on a lost deer. But I, I'm very adamant when I say it's normally not the that you wounded the deer and it got off. You just didn't find it. You know, and that's what a mechanical does these days is it it increases the amount of blood on the ground, right? It's a huge, huge hole. Um, and, and talking about penetration, the hunt that we did last year in, in Wyoming with Ralph and Lenore at Trophy Ridge Outfitters, which people have seen on the TV show, I shot a buck at, at 40 yards with my medium weight arrow. I pulled the shot a little right, and that a sever, 100 grain sever, went right through the scapula and s- stopped on the other scapula, broke the arrow off, and that deer didn't go very far. So talk about penetration. Uh, you can't argue with it. Just can't. So that stuff has really improved. Oh boy, <laughs> really improved. And that's only that's twenty years maybe. Uh, I, yeah. I remember uh, it was probably late nineties when when uh, the vortexes and the, uh, and all those were starting to come out. I mean uh, NAP they came out with some great broadheads back then, uh, expandables. But I do remember you were shooting those Rocky Mountains like darts, and um, it's hard to argue with that. I mean if you can shoot a fixed blade broadhead more power to you i mean it's it's you know tomato tomato how you want to do it you know as long as you're as long as you're putting it where it needs to go yeah that's the thing you shot placement is everything and with today's equipment if you put it in the spot you'll you'll have a good result so you talked about bear hunting and that's where i want to go with this we call this i don't know what we call it fire camp stories deer camp stories um you have a lot of them, and I've been I've been fortunate to experience some of them, but not this one. Tell <laughs> us about. You probably have how many grizzlies have you killed? Twelve. Twelve grizzly bears, and I know that you've got some stories there, but one in particular uh, that might stand out. Well, uh, we talked about this earlier. So when I first moved to Alaska in. 1991, I thought I was something, man. I was young and fit and strong, and I'd bow hunted all over the place. And, you know, I was full of myself, a little pompous punk, really. <laughs> and uh, I, I thought, well, you know, I'm going to shoot a brown bear with a bow. Okay. So I had a buddy, and, and we had a place, and we went out to the Alaska Peninsula. And we're cruising around. It's in October, and there's a salmon run. And so uh, we, by and by, we are in a little boat, and we look around. Here's this giant bear head in the lake and he's swimming across the little isthmus so we motor over there and the bear goes into the into the woods and and the plan was for my buddy to secure the boat i was going to jump out go find the bear and then he was going to catch up with me and be, be my backup we'd figure out what to do so i had an old 338 remington model 700 that i always carried as a backup rifle when i bow hunted so i strapped that on grabbed my little bow and i ran into the woods while he was securing the boat and there was the bear. He had only gone in there maybe 50, 75 yards, laying on his back in the grass, drying himself off. So he was about 40 yards. I just knelt down, knocked him out. I thought, he's going to stand up and I'll shoot him. Be no big deal, you know. Well, I don't know how he knew I was there because the wind was perfect. Everything was great. I'm waist high in the grass. I'm knocked. He rolls over, stands up, and he looks right at me. And all of a sudden, he's a German short hair and I'm a quail. And he, he is on point, and he starts shaking his head, and he starts rolling his tongue, popping his teeth, and I'm terrified, you know. And he turned his head away for one second, and I, I was shooting fingers. I let go of the fingers. I reached down and grabbed my rifle. He turned his head back and charged me. He was 35 yards. So I raised the rifle up, dropped my bow, raised the rifle up, and he was 15 feet from me. I just pulled the trigger like a shotgun, rolled over into the fetal position, and was prepared to become a badminton bird. And uh, nothing happened. Nothing happened, and I'm laying there quiet. I'm afraid if I wiggle, he's looking at me, and he's going to beat the snot out of me. And I probably laid there for three hours, which is like two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and my buddy Bo comes running into the woods with his gun, and he knew that I wouldn't shoot a gun unless something went wrong. And he's like, what? He saw me laying there, and he thought I was dead. <laughs> and he's looking around, he's, he's screaming, and I looked up. And uh, 
some, by the grace of God, my bullet had gone under that bear's chin, went through his throat and broke his atlas joint, killed him dead. And he was laying 10 feet from me, basically. And I'm not ashamed to tell you that I did wet my pants. That's back. Jeez. I I think I would have done more than wet my pants. Yeah, it was, uh, well, I I was puckered up too much to do it. (laughs) It was bad news. And that was a full-grown grizzly bear. He was a giant bear. He weighed a thousand pounds, probably nine hundred pounds. I mean, we, the two of us could not roll him over to skin him. We had to shove him into a little ditch, and he rolled himself over so we could get him skinned out. It was, Man, he's a giant. That's, oh my God, he'd have killed me. <laughs> that's insane. How many? How many of you shot with a bow and arrow? Three. Three with a bow and arrow, and it's like this Fred Bear on the beach, hiding behind a rock kind of deal. I, uh, one was a grizzly in the mountain that I did a stock on from above. And another was, uh, a bear that was feeding in salmon stream and I, the, the stream noise let me get within 15 yards of him and I shot him and he died in the river and we had to drag a wet bear out of the river. And that was another horror story after dark, but it's super fun. Dangerous game hunting. It's kind of fun. I killed a cave buffalo once um, with a bow. That was fun. And I don't know. Today you're just kind of slowing down. I know you shot a lot of sheep. Um, I know that, I mean, basically you've been mostly deer hunting lately, haven't you? Yeah, mostly. When I moved back to the lower 48, um, I moved back down here in 2005. I was in Arizona for 15 years and got back into the deer hunting really, really serious. Although I never gave up the whitetail hunting. You know, no. I traveled out of Alaska and, and would whitetail hunt for a month. But um, deer and elk hunting lately has been the big deal, and I love, I love that. Um, but I, the whitetail hunting is just super fun. There's something about it. It's a, it's a big chess game, you know, and they always win. The one you Don't shot play. last year in Wyoming, I mean, that was – to me, I know it wasn't probably a big deal for you, but if you guys haven't seen that episode, please watch it. It's on our YouTube channel. But um, I had hunted that deer for like three days. And here comes yep. Bo- here comes Bob. To just you you finish the story. Well, you know, you, you were in the spot because you're Dan Schmidt, the guy, and I'm just, <laughs> I'm just I'm just like you know chopped liver. So I'm in another spot with Ian, and uh, we're struggling, and you guys are in the middle of deer like crazy. It doesn't work, and you decide to go to this other spot, shoot this gorgeous ten point, right? And the minute you shoot this gorgeous ten point, we're like, hey, is that big six point? Is that is that up for grabs now and they're like yeah well let's go because i love funky deer you know big sixes and funky antlers and old so we got on that thing and uh it was quite the quest we had <laughs> for sure you well know, he it, was very- so explain that because we were hunting over a, it was a millet field uh the blind was it was like a hay bale blind but yes. i was just so impressed and actually if you go back to the year before that your strategy, remember that the one year before where we moved up, we went in the middle of the day, yes. moved yes. the blind, and I'm like, there's no freaking way I'm going to, and boom, I killed a deer that night because of you. But um, go through that thought yes. process, go through that thought process on last year's buck. Basically, we were hunting this ABL blind in the millet field, but you decided, you know what, you, within hours, you knew how, how that buck was behaving. Well, what, what we saw, I think, was that, and I don't know if it was because we had pressured him a little bit, although I didn't think we really did, but maybe we did. And so he had moved his pattern down the creek bottom that he was using a couple hundred yards. But the, the, the hub of the hunt was a pair of oaks that were dropping like crazy. And every time, and we would see that deer twice a day, right? And he was always under those oaks. And then he would move around to the millet field or an alfalfa field, and then he would go back to the creek bottom to bed. So then it was, we were running out of time, and it's like, what are we going to do? We have to hunt the hub. So how are we going to hunt the hub with a camera guy and all that? Well, we need to set a blind. So, well, let's set a blind far enough away from that oak tree with the wind right and all that that maybe it won't bust him and yada, yada. What do we got to lose? So we did. We set a, a ground blind. Our guide, Larry Compton, was great. Larry had a blind in his truck. Let's do it. He was in. We set the blind up 40 yards from that oak tree. And uh, Ian and I said, let's let's give it the afternoon to rest. We'll go hunt another place, and then we'll try it in the morning and uh, see if it happens. So we went to another place that night hoping, you know, oh, a giant buck will come. I forget how many deer we saw, 20, 
we had a couple bed like five yards from the line, but no bucks. So the next morning we go to the blind and we're like, okay, we seen there at nine in the morning. You know, we got a long time to wait. It's cold. You know, we're freezing. We're shivering. Oh, it's six o'clock. There he is. You know, and he came really cautious to those trees. He, there was a doe or two and he looked and walked off into some other little trees and we're like, okay, he'll be back. He was back in 15 minutes and we shot him at like 6.20 in the morning. So it worked out. But, you know, sometimes you just got to roll the dice and go with it and see what happens. So we did, and it worked out, but sometimes it doesn't. That's what I liked about it most because you have that attitude. It's basically, it's a positive attitude, whereas my negative attitude is like, yeah, there's no freaking way this deer's going to come through. But <laughs> <laughs> that basically when you decide what you think might work, you just go for it. And uh, Well, it, and the, other th- the other thing we did that, uh, that we set that blind in the morning because we had gone out looking for him in the morning, and we did see it from the truck under those oak trees, but there was no way to, to hunt him. So when we set the blind, we went back to camp and I knew what the shot was going to be. It was going to be 40 yards. So I sat down in a chair. Ralph has a life-size deer. We shot how many arrows at that deer yep. 40 yards from the chair? 50, yep. 60, yep. I don't know, a lot to make sure everything was dialed in for that specific hunt. And it all worked out. I forgot about that because that's, that's something that I just kind of gloss over in the fact that you not only figured out where that deer was, but then when we went back, you practiced for, I mean, I remember shooting arrows for two hours and you yeah, wanted to make fun. sure that that's the distance. That's going to be the farthest distance I have. And I want to make sure I can be able to hit that before we go out and try to kill this deer. That's right. I mean, 40 yards is a makeable shot, but it's a long shot and you want to make sure that everything's just right. And, yeah. and it was, and that deer gave us a broadside shot. He was walking like super slow. So it wasn't a big deal. Wow. Wow. You know, down he went. Down and I got to tell you, I was shaking like a leaf, man. Ian and I were like high-fiving and yelling and screaming. And then it's like, no, no, be quiet. We don't know. Was he down? I don't know. <laughs> it was pretty fun. Get on the radio. Call Larry. <laughs> and Larry, Larry comes, and I'll never forget the, the smiles and those pictures. It was, that was awesome. I mean, it, it was awesome. And it was just the way that all came together. was, it was a fabulous. Was and awesome. And we're going to do it again this year, I hope. Absolutely. It's going to be September 1st. Yeah. O- opening day. Of, and now, that's the other thing, too. People say, oh, well, yeah, that's Wyoming. I know, but um, can you hunt like that in Pennsylvania or, you know, some of these higher pressure areas? Maybe not. Well, why not? I mean, why not? It, it's opening day. The deer in the belt. Right. Are very, they're very patternable, right? And patternable. You know, they're going to they're be on agriculture somewhere. Uh, the year before, we hunted late in September, and you had killed your deer, and I went through the transition where – all of a sudden, the, the acorns started dropping, and the deer were gone from the, from the ag fields. So we had to make a move and find an oak tree that was dropping, and we did, and killed the deer that morning. You know, So, yeah, the early I love the early season hunts because you know what the deer are going to do, basically. You have to just know where. But they're going to be on the ag until the acorns drop, and then you got to go, go get them like today. Yeah. You know, that was... move. Don't, sit there. Don't sit on the ag field for four more days because they're not coming. They're going to the acorns. That was my point in the fact that time it based off a of season, but also those, I guess you call aggressive strategies. Like you say, sometimes you have to roll the dice. Uh, if you don't, you're never going to know. Rather than doing control- the same thing over and over and over again and get, being fail, 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 yeah. fail, fail. Yeah, I, I call it controlled aggression. You know, you, you want to make a change or move and be aggressive, but by the same token, you don't want to go in there like a wild man and blow everything up. So. You know, it's baby steps, but you got to take the steps to make it happen sometimes. Absolutely, 100%. So I'm going to I'm gonna end this one right here, Bob. I want to thank you so much for joining us. We're definitely having you back, obviously, because we have so much to talk about. But before we let Bob go, I want to remind everybody, you can read Bob's current work in Deer and Deer Hunting, the Bow Shop column especially, anything technical archery related, and also our feature stories. Um, that Bob has in there because he's not not only just the tactics, but some of his views on hunting and life in general are just fascinating. Bob, thank you very much for joining us, and we're going to catch up with you real soon. Thank you, Dan. Looking forward to September. Awesome. For Bob Rob, I am Dan Schmidt. Thank you for listening and watching Deer Talk Now. <laughs>